How can you study more effectively? Let's see what the science has to say. As a cognitive scientist and psychology professor, let me tell you some things about memory that might change the way that you study for the better. When studying for an exam, do you read and highlight and reread the material? Do you cram in long study sessions and maybe pull all-nighters? Well, I have some bad news and some good news. The bad news is that these are really ineffective ways to study. The good news is that there are scientifically proven ways to do better. A mistake that people often make is that they study material until they recognize it as familiar. This I know. Oh, that I know. This I know. That I know. But that's very different from being able to reach in and pull out information from memory, or to recall it, which after all is largely what you're going to be tested on. Describe Ebbinghaus's research on the forgetting curve? What? So how do we go from just being able to recognize material to being able to pull it from memory or to recall it? Well, believe it or not, one way is to make studying more difficult. There is a difference between what psychologists call desirable difficulties and undesirable difficulties. Desirable difficulties are those that may slow you down and which make studying more difficult in the moment, but which in doing so help that material stick with you. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you about three do's and one don't when studying. That is, three desirable difficulties that you should embrace, and one undesirable difficulty to avoid. The first desirable difficulty is known as retrieval practice, and it's been shown time and time again to be one of the most powerful ways that you can improve your own learning. And it's just what it sounds like. Practice retrieving information that you've already studied. The reason that retrieval practice is so powerful comes down to a distinction that cognitive scientists make between encoding and retrieval. When studying, students often spend all their time trying to get that information into memory, which is what we call encoding, that they overlook the need to practice pulling that information back out from memory and onto the page, which is what we call retrieval. I bet I can get some of you to experience the difference between encoding and retrieval right now. Can you name these words? 1. Words or phrases that read the same backwards and forwards. And 2. Magical pieces of jewelry that people wear to protect themselves from evil spirits. Even if you have trouble retrieving these words from memory, I can almost guarantee that you have encoded them sometime in the past. Because if I ask you which ones are amulets and which ones are palindromes, you'll probably get it right away. See, the problem wasn't that you had never encoded in, in the information. What it shows instead is that we can often have difficulty retrieving information from memory. And that's one reason why it's so important that students practice retrieving material that they've studied, whether it's through testing themselves with flashcards or writing down everything that they remember about a topic on the page. In a classic study demonstrating the importance of retrieval practice, students read reading comprehension passages. Then they either restudied the passages or they practiced recalling uh, the passages from memory. Guess which students remembered those passages better later on? It was the students who had practiced retrieving the passages from memory. In an interesting twist, this happened despite the fact that it was the students who had restudied the passages who had higher confidence that they would remember them later on. Maybe because that comfortable feeling of familiarity that they experienced when rereading them made them overconfident. A second do when studying is known as spaced practice. Over a century's worth of research shows that it's often more beneficial to study in shorter sessions spaced apart in time than to save it all for one long cramming session. Accounts differ for why spaced practice is so effective, but one reason might come down to the concept of consolidation. This refers to the fact that once you've learned something, those neural connections that you've just formed continue to solidify even after you've turned your attention to something else. Think of it like painting a room. If it's going to take more than one coat of paint to get a nice uniform look, you start painting the second coat as soon as you're done painting the first coat? No, you give that first coat of paint time to dry, so it serves as a better foundation for the second coat. Memory is similar. It's often more effective to give memories from one study session time to consolidate and solidify before reactivating them in the next study session. A third important strategy is known as elaboration. As you're learning material, try to think about how it relates to other things that you might know or care about, or think of examples from your own life. The uh, more links that you're able to make, uh, the better that material will stick with you. 
The strategy of elaboration actually reminds me of a classic scene from the movie Spider-Man 2, starring Tobey Maguire. In that scene, an out-of-control train is speeding towards certain doom, and Spider-Man tries to stop it. First, he slings one web and then another, connecting the train to a nearby building, but the train doesn't even slow down. It's only when he slings one web after another after another, connecting the train to the multiple different buildings around it, that the train finally slows down and stops. Trying to get new information to stick in memory is like trying to trap a speeding train. The more you're able to mentally link it to other things that you know about or care about, the more successful you'll be. There are also some tricks you can try to make elaboration more effective for you. As you're linking the new material to examples from your own life, try to pick ones that are concrete and easy to visualize. I'll show you why. Here, let's read through these words together, and then I'm going to ask you to try to remember them. Peacock, zombie, wood, armchair, except, ever, enough, although, baby, axe, pizza, belly button, since, basically, lately, binoculars, somewhat, light bulb. Now pause the video and try to write down or remember at least five words from that list. Did you remember more nouns than non-nouns? Most people do, and the reason is because it's easier to remember things that are concrete and easy to visualize. I'm also willing to bet that many of you specifically remembered the word zombie. Why would that be? Well, it turns out that things that spark an emotional reaction in us tend to stick in memory. So rather than just reading and highlighting and rereading material as you study, try to think of examples that are concrete easy to visualize, and that you have feelings about or care about. In fact, let's see if we can do that right now to help you remember the three strategies that I just talked about. Let's say that you really like movies and TV shows. You might try thinking of how famous actors use these three strategies to remember their lines. For example, on medical dramas, actors often have to remember a lot of complex medical terminology. So you might think about Kelly McCreary, who played Dr. Maggie Pierce on Grey's Anatomy. She said, it's really hard for me to memorize the medical jargon if I don't know the meaning of every single word. So I have to do a little Wikipedia YouTube research to figure out what I'm talking about. And so there you have a concrete example of an actor learning her lines through the use of elaboration. Or you might think of Jim Parsons, best known for playing Sheldon Cooper on The Big Bang Theory, who said, I really just run rampant around my apartment saying these words, this dialogue, over and over. I'd go outside and say it. I'd sit down and say it. I'd stand up and run while saying it. And so there you have a concrete example of an actor learning his lines through the strategy of retrieval practice. Or you might think of Matthew McConaughey, who you might know from countless Hollywood blockbusters, who said, I read it after a run. I read it late Saturday night. I read it right after church. Many different places where I am personally, I'll read a script. And so there you have a concrete example of a famous actor learning his part through spaced practice. Now that I've told you about three do's when studying, or three desirable difficulties to embrace, let me tell you about one very important don't, or one very undesirable difficulty. That undesirable difficulty is sleep loss. Don't pull those all-nighters if you can help it. In one recent study, researchers tested over 600 students and found that the less sleep they got per night, the lower their grade point average at the end of the term. Why should that be? Well, in addition to sleep loss hurting cognition generally, a lot of that consolidation that I talked about earlier, well, a lot of that happens when we're sleeping. So don't miss out on sleep if you can help it. So there you have it, three do's and one don't when studying. If you make studying more difficult for yourself in the right way, then it can actually help you. Don't always look for the quickest and easiest way to study. Because when you do that, it's in one ear and out the other. It's those desirable difficulties that can help us create memories that stick and which we can carry with us into the future. Remember that.